Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jean Oi. I am the director of Stanford's China program and professor of political science. Um, I want to welcome you to today's program on China's civilian army, uh, the markings, the makings of the uh, wolf warrior diplomacy. Um, but before we do that, I just want to give you a heads up on an important event that we have coming up next week. And I think that a lot of you know that um, at the end of the month, the UN, the 26th UN Climate Change Conference is going to happen in Glasgow, which is, you know, obviously very important. And as part of the APARC uh, series on um, the climate change in Asia, the China program is going to be um, presenting um, uh, uh, an event next Tuesday at four o'clock. Uh, Victoria Sharan Shan, who's a professor at uh, assistant professor at the um, University of Virginia, uh, will be uh, giving a talk on China tackles climate, and that's going to be um, based on a forthcoming book that she has. But now let me turn to today's um, uh, featured event, and we're very pleased to have uh, Peter Martin. Uh, give us a talk on a topic that I'm sure many of us have really lots of questions about. And that is, uh, we know there's this uh, phenomenon that we um, have been calling the wolf warrior diplomacy. And uh, Peter has uh, just come out with a um, very nice book from Oxford University Press this past June. Um, and um, he um, uh, will be, so it's, uh, he's going to talk a bit about the history of China's diplomacy, but I understand that he's going to be talking um, a lot about this uh, idea and sort of giving some insights into the, the rise of this um, wolf warrior. Um, and uh, so I will um, you know, turn it over to Peter, but let me just say a bit about him. He is a, Peter is a defense policy and intelligence reporter for Bloomberg News. He's rich, written extensively on um, escalating tensions in US-China relations, including uh, on uh, North Korea and Xinjiang. He's, his articles have appeared in Foreign Affairs, National Interest, The Guardian, Jamestown China Brief. He uh, was, uh, has a degree from Oxford, uh, but he also then uh, went to Peking University, did a master's there, and then went on to the London School of Economics for graduate work. And I, I uh, welcome uh, Peter, but also let me just say that uh, Peter and I have decided that we're going to um, actually uh, spend a little more time with Q&A. Because uh, he actually says he enjoys Q and A a lot more than <laughs> giving formal presentations, and I think that's great. So uh, please put your questions in the Q and A box, and I will curate them um, after um, formal remarks by Peter. So with that, Peter, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, it's a it's a real pleasure to be to be doing this. Um, both of my editors, actually my primary editors in, in Washington are Stanford grads. So uh, I feel like I, I should get some kind of honorary status for that, but uh, oh, okay. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about how I came to write the book and then um, we can discuss some of the, the kind of key findings. Um, and you know, I, I, as as you said, I'm really happy that we'll have um, lots of time for for Q and A at the end. Um, so, I uh, I arrived back in China in in 2017 um, after being away for a few years. Um, but I previously lived there on and off from 2000 you know 2008 onwards. Um, and you know, when when I arrived back, I was immediately struck by the extraordinary economic um, and military progress that, that China had made. Um, you know, it was, uh, its economy was beating estimates. Um, Xi Jinping was rolling out the Belt and Road Infrastructure Initiative across the world. The Chinese military was busy uh, building its first overseas base in Djibouti and militarizing islands in the South China Sea. Um, and, and at the same time as, as China was pushing forward so ambitiously, um, of course, President Donald Trump was busy picking fights with US allies and multilateral organizations and, and creating kind of a, a leadership void 
in which it looked like China had this opportunity to, to step up and fill. Um, but, but as the years um, kind of rolled on, um, it became clearer and clearer that for whatever reason, China seemed to be incapable of, of, of stepping up and, and using diplomatic and persuasive power to make its case to the world in the way that it needed to. You know, it was great at using um, economic inducements to win over others, and it, it could be very effective at using coercive tactics to stop others speaking out when it wanted to. But that actual ability to persuade really seemed to, um, to fall short. And, you know, I, I started to think about this is, you know, this is going to be really important when you consider the kind of world that we're, we're moving into. Um, as, as US preeminence slowly wanes internationally, we're going to live in a world where there are multiple competing centers of power. And the ability to persuade others using diplomacy and using other tools is going to command an increasing premium. Um, and th those countries which can do it effectively are going to have an advantage. Um, and, and so as I came to sort of think about China's shortcomings in that area, I started to see Chinese diplomats in particular as kind of a, a microcosm of China's broader struggle to communicate. And, you know, I, I was working at, as, at the time as a foreign correspondent in Beijing and interacting a lot with the foreign ministry in that, in that process and talking, of course, to, to foreign diplomats a lot as well, whose primary interlocutors were the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, and, and, and other uh, Chinese envoys. And, and when you, it's funny because when you interact with them on a personal level, um, you know, Chinese diplomats can come across as suave and funny, sophisticated, certainly well-read. Many of them have degrees from fancy places like Georgetown, they speak, languages raised you know ranging from Czech to Indonesian to Arabic and and you name it um but but when they get up on the podium to speak in the foreign ministry or they sit down across the table from their American and and other foreign interlocutors they suddenly kind of change personality and and become quite stilted um well rehearsed and and, and you know to some extent ideological and also in in recent years um kind of increasingly belligerent in the way that they have interacted with the outside world and so i started to kind of look into that doing interviews as far as i could with with chinese diplomats in beijing and, and with foreign diplomats but especially to look into this this group of memoirs that i found by former um Chinese envoys and um, you know I started out with just a, a couple by former foreign ministers which I knew were out there but but you did a lot of googling and and Baidu searching and <clears throat> poking around dusty dusty secondhand bookstores and, and I realized that there were more than a hundred um, of these memoirs mainly published between the late 1990s and um, kind of the the around you know around the 2010 2012 mark um, and th th these are pretty boring books that that relay kind of endless meetings and foreign travel and and, and uh, you know of course have all have all gone through the the kind of watchful eye of of Beijing censors, but but kind of hidden among all of those dull details are little um, little features of life um, for Chinese diplomacy that illuminate what it's like to make China's case to the world. So that really, that really formed my primary um, source base for the book. And, you know, when I, when I started out um, doing this in, in 2017, um, Chinese diplomacy was a pretty niche and geeky topic, you know, for, for whatever reason it, it, it had captivated me, but um, there wasn't a huge amount of focus on it. But, you know, as the years wore on, we saw examples of Chinese diplomats storming out of international meetings, telling foreign leaders to shut up, uh, spreading conspiracy theories on, on Twitter, and all of the 
antics which have, have collectively become known um, as wolf warrior diplomacy. Um, but, but I guess, you know, what I really learned from, from, from writing the book and researching the book was that these kinds of outbursts, which we think of as very, very new, um, actually go back a long, long way and have their roots kind of in the, in the culture and history of the, the foreign ministry itself. So when the People's Republic of China was founded in 1949 um, by Mao Zedong, China basically had no diplomats to speak of. Um, most of the diplomats who belonged to the, the, the previous nationalist government had fled to Taiwan, and those who stayed behind were considered too ideologically impure to represent this new communist government that was going to remake China and reposition China in the world. Um, and and the, the new leadership of the new China kind of faced this paradoxical challenge. Um, you know, on the one hand, it was led by the Communist Party, which had spent decades as an underground organization fighting for its life militarily, maintaining strict discipline for its membership, um, and, 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 you know, constantly worried about outside threats. So this was a, this was a paranoid, um, secretive political movement. But, you know, on the other hand, it also needed to communicate with the outside world. Uh, the, the new communist government in Beijing didn't really have any friends or allies outside of the Soviet bloc. Um, and it, it needed to build bridges and establish itself globally as the credible, legitimate government of, of China. And so to kind of square that circle, to meet that paradoxical challenge, um, Zhou Enlai, who was the, the, the PRC's first foreign minister, came up with this idea that Chinese diplomats would think and act like the People's Liberation Army in civilian clothing. So their behavior would be modeled on the ethos of this revolutionary fighting force, which had just catapulted the, the Communist Party to power. Um, and what, what Zhou meant by that was that Chinese diplomats would be unfailingly loyal to the Communist Party, just like the People's Liberation Army. Um, they would be disciplined to a fault. And, and crucially, they would display what he called a fighting spirit as they protected China's interests um, across the world. And, and that kind of martial militaristic ethos led to the, the development of a, a set of very distinctive features for Chinese diplomats, which, which started out in that kind of 1949 period and, and many of which have lasted right through till today. So Chinese diplomats will stick closely to talking points, even when it's clear to them that those talking points don't resonate and aren't helping them to make progress with the person sitting across the table from them. They will uh, often move around in pairs um, to, in order to keep tabs on each other and ensure that no secret information is, is leaked to the outside. Um, they will on occasion shout at foreign counterparts when they feel cornered or they worry that not doing so will lead them to, to be um, seen as weak back home. And, and they'll elevate even the smallest of um, slights or insults um, into sometimes major international incidents and issues because they worry that if they fail to do so, they'll be judged as disloyal by their bosses in Beijing. And, you know, this, this kind of approach led to displays of what we would now label wolf warrior diplomacy right from the outset. So, uh, and, and especially at times of domestic uncertainty at home. Um, in, in 1950, uh, Wu Xiuquan, who was this kind of veteran uh, Chinese revolutionary, um, emerged from the, the, the civil war with a kind of bullet scar across his, his cheek. He led this delegation to the United Nations in New York, and he delivered a speech which kind of makes today's wolf warrior diplomats look, um, look like a bunch of, of, of shrinking violets. He, um, his speech was described by Time magazine at the time as two awful hours of rasping vituperation. 
So that gives you some idea of the, the kind of tone that he set in the room. And of course, in, in the following decades, Chinese diplomats were um, expelled from countries like Indonesia and Kenya for their behavior during the Cultural Revolution, handing out copies of Mao Zedong's Little Red Books, delivering these, um, you know, kind of displays of performative anger and, and, and lectures on the importance of, of Maoist philosophy. And in London, uh, diplomats from the Chinese um, representative office actually got into fistfights um, on the streets. And one diplomat was seen wielding an ax um, in the face of, of protesters. Um, so, so, so those kind of wolf warrior tactics go back a very long way. Um, but it's, you know, it's important to remember at the same time, there was another tendency in Chinese diplomacy. Um, and and that the China's diplomatic corps was capable of taking that extraordinary discipline uh, that Zhou and Lai had demanded of them and using it to charm the world and build influence. Um, and so in the 1950s, China launched um, an incredibly successful charm offensive um, toward the middle of the decade, you know, the, the kind of seminal moment of which was the Bandong Conference for African and Asian um, developing nations, um, where, where Zhou Enlai kind of set aside his kind of standard ideological talking points. He played down the issue of Taiwan's um, status, and he really set about building influence with that non-aligned bloc that wasn't committed to either China, to either the Soviet Union or America in the Cold War. We also saw a kind of charm offensive of, of, of similar um, scale and success in the 1990s after the Tiananmen massacre, when uh, you know China sort of set about this, this two decade process of rehabilitating its reputation, um, which culminated, of course, ultimately in Beijing hosting the 2008 Summer Olympics. Um, so there have been these two tendencies that have kind of cycled back and forth over time. One tendency is to, to charm the world, and the other tendency is to kind of use wolf warrior tactics to tell the world off. Um, and, and I think recently we've seen a pretty decisive lurch back toward that kind of wolf warrior combative assertiveness um, in Chinese diplomacy. And, and I think it's been driven by two things. So, so on the one hand, there is this new confidence that China has um, about its place in the world. And on the other hand, there are these enduring insecurities that, that sit alongside it and have kind of been amplified by the, the political project of Xi Jinping. So, so the new confidence started um, around 2008 after China hosted the Olympics, but especially after the onset of the 2008 to nine global financial crisis. Um, you know, Chinese leaders looked around the world and saw the, the, the relatively slow kind of ponderous response of Western policymakers to that crisis and compared it with their own ability to deliver a massive stimulus package to the Chinese economy. Um, and of course, that, you know, that stimulus package caused all kinds of problems for China later on, but at the time it was, it was widely hailed as help, having helped to save the global economy. So they, you know, China's leaders looked around and, and, and kind of thought, you know, we've, we've been really deferential to to the West and we've tried to learn from its economic models, but perhaps, perhaps we don't need to take those lessons anymore. Perhaps we can be confident in our own system. Um, and and, and that, that series of events led to a shift um, to a kind of more assertive style of diplomacy ar around 2008, 9, 10, um, which really uh, became much more apparent and, and much clear, clearer after Xi Jinping became Communist Party boss in 2012. Um, and after she came to power, he also kind of instigated this, this new set of domestic policies, which radically changed the domestic context for the political context for Chinese diplomats. 
So under, under Xi, Chinese politics have, have become an increasingly tense um, and sometimes even scary place. Um, she launched a sweeping anti-corruption campaign, which has punished more than 1.5 million officials. Um, he has abolished presidential term limits, uh, make, setting himself up uh, likely as leader for life. He has experimented with the use of re-education camps in far west China, uh, and, and he has focused on ideological orthodoxy at home, um, and, and many of his speeches have, have this theme of hostility to, to Western cultural and political influence running through them. And, you know, those, those signs have been troubling to, to many outsiders, but they, they are especially um, acutely troubling, I think, to, to veterans of the Chinese political system. And when when Chinese diplomats or other officials see these signs, they, they understand them with a kind of contextual uh, richness that, that many of us on the outside um, lack. And what, what I mean by that is over the decades, um, you know, foreign ministry officials have experienced multiple rounds of political purges where colleagues were encouraged to inform on each other, um, you know, protracted criticism and self-criticism sessions using Leninist techniques of, of political control. And in, in, in the Cultural Revolution, um, things got so extreme that uh, Chinese ambassadors were actually locked in cellars by their own diplomats. Um, they were forced to clean toilets and in some cases beaten until they, they coughed up blood. Um, and, and indeed, uh, later on in the, in the 60s, quite a large number of Chinese diplomats were themselves sent to re-education camps in the Chinese countryside in order to reform the way that they thought about Chinese politics. And so what I, what the upshot of that, I think, is that the Chinese diplomats know acutely how high the stakes can be when you get on the wrong side of the Chinese political system or the person who is in charge of that system. Um, and all of these things combined, I think, to create um, kind of a new tone for, for Chinese diplomacy. Um, so as, as Xi Jinping in his speeches started to talk more about the, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, um, how China was standing tall in the East, was moving closer to the center of the world stage, um, and, and, and also to say things like China would never give up one inch of territory and would never tolerate bullying by foreign oppressors. Chinese diplomats started to kind of mimic that tone that, that he put across in his speeches. Um, and if they were ambitious, maybe they would, they would take that tone and they'd add a little bit of extra zeal just for good measure. Um, and they also began you know, these displays where they were handing out copies of, of Xi Jinping's book on governance at diplomatic events, echoing the way that their predecessors had handed out copies of Mao's Little Red Book decades before. Um, and that new tone really went into high gear um, after the coronavirus outbreak, um, when we saw a series of outbursts from, from Chinese envoys. Um, and, and they, they kind of felt on the one hand threatened by the fact that China was being criticized for its role in the outbreak of the virus, but also emboldened by the fact that, that Western countries on the whole had, had handled the virus so badly. Um, and that, that once again, you know, they had, um, they didn't need to take lessons from the West and, and certainly didn't need to be talked down to by, by Western leaders. Um, and, and as, as they did so, as they, as they lashed out at criticisms using these, what's become known as these wolf warrior tactics, um, Xi Jinping seemed to, to cheer on what they were doing. And he actually issued a handwritten note to the foreign ministry calling for more fighting spirit. Um, and in the context of, of the kind of political atmosphere that I've described, you can imagine how that would have gone down, um, I think. Any, any self-interested Chinese official would have pretty quickly fallen into line um, behind that command. And, and I guess if one diplomat became emblematic of 
the shift in, in Chinese diplomacy. It was, it was Zhao Lijin, who is now one of the, the spokespeople at the foreign ministry. Zhao uh, started off as this, this relatively obscure figure in the foreign ministry who was posted to the embassy in Islamabad. Um, and, 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 and quite unusually um, for a Chinese diplomat at the time, he amassed quite a large following on Twitter. And he, he used that platform to pick a fight, an online spat with um, former US national security advisor, Susan Rice. Um, and, 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 and that incident kind of led to him rocketing up the hierarchy in the foreign ministry and being appointed um, spokesman, making him one of the most prominent um, representatives of the Chinese government um, in the world. And, and he, you know, he used that position to kind of pick fights with pretty much everyone who came across his path, but, but especially with the Trump White House. And uh, on, on, a, on a series of occasions um, in, in spring 2020, he sent uh, a bunch of tweets which suggested that the US Army may have deliberately started the coronavirus pandemic in, in Wuhan, which caused consternation all the way up to the, the Oval Office. Um, but, you know, Zhao, Zhao wasn't alone. There were other envoys kind of acting in the same way at the same time. Gui Tong Yo, who was China's ambassador in Sweden at the time, was summoned to the country's foreign ministry 40 times in the space of two years. And um, he said in an interview with the media when he was questioned about his tactics, uh, for our friends, we have fine wine, and for our enemies, we have shotguns. Um, not, not everyone in China's diplomatic circles uh, agrees with this approach. Uh, Yuan Nansheng, who was China's former consul general in, in San Francisco, actually warned publicly that um, uh, about the dangers of extreme nationalism in Chinese foreign policy and suggested that these kind of tactics might generate a significant backlash. And actually even Xi Jinping himself uh, in remarks at a Politburo study session earlier this year, talked about the need for China to cultivate a more lovable image in the world, um, which I think was at least a modest recognition that, um, that China, and especially Chinese diplomats, have been uh, more, more scary and, and fearsome than, than lovable um, in recent years. But, you know, as, as I said at the outset, Anyone who has spent time looking at the history of Chinese diplomats knows that, that actually this kind of fighting spirit and combative approach has been in the DNA of China's diplomatic core right from the outset. Um, and, and with that, I guess, um, why don't I pause my remarks and um, I'm looking forward to a, to a really interesting discussion. Um, thank you, Peter. That was uh, fascinating. Um, let me start out uh because this is these questions i've had a lot about this wolf warrior so it's very enlightening and i guess um i have a, a number of questions but when you touched on it's very useful to know for example that there are a lot of historical presence for this wolf warrior and and that you you see the scary and the lovable um and i just wanted to ask for a broad question um and that is so this What's in the past, at least, what seems to be the trigger to go from one to the other? Is there any kind of, are there any generalizations you could um, make about that? Yeah, I think, I think it's often been um, times of political crackdowns in Beijing that have led to, to envoys acting in this way. Um, so, if you think about um, the very strident way that Chinese diplomats defended the Great Leap Forward overseas and, and wouldn't tolerate any criticism of it, uh, that, that, that behavior, I think, owes a lot to the fact that China had just gone through the anti-rightist campaign and many cadres in the foreign ministry had been punished and some had been fired for being insufficiently loyal to or per perceived to be in insufficiently loyal to, to Chairman Mao's political program. In the, in the Cultural Revolution, you had this environment where you know, diplomats were terrified of what might happen to them the next day. Um, as, as the atmosphere built up 
um, in the foreign ministry, you know, Chinese diplomats were kind of looking at the newspapers and trying to figure out what they had to do. Some of them were throwing away high heeled shoes and pictures that showed them with foreigners and, and you know, trying, trying to, to, to create um, a, some sense of safety for themselves. And as you know, in, in the Cultural Revolution, the very safest thing you could do was to quote Mao Zedong thought. Right. And if you're a Chinese diplomat, you better do, you know, you're, you better do that overseas as well as when you're back in the embassy. So they started acting in this way that, you know, was really quite unbefitting of the way that they, you know, they just spent a couple of decades building their foreign service from scratch and cultivating ties with the world. And they threw it away in an instant. I, I don't think that was to do with, um, you know, Chinese diplomats being ignorant, they, they, they knew that these tactics would alienate the audiences they spoke to, but their primary concern was um, the audience back home and the desire to keep themselves safe and perhaps also to advance their careers. And, you know, the, the political environment now in China is very different to that of the Cultural Revolution, but I think there's something about the way that the incentives work in the foreign ministry that is not the same as then, but it kind of rhymes with that experience. We've got increased tension, focus on ideology, purges, the use, you know, in Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign, um, political disloyalty is seen as a form of corruption. So it's not just graft, it's, it's yeah. much broader than that. And if you're in that kind of environment where you're, you're worried politically about yourself, your family, your colleagues, Xi Jinping is giving these kind of blistering speeches that are, that are pretty nationalist in content, then your best bet, again, for self-preservation, but also for career advancement, is to just match that tone and add a little extra spice just for, for good measure. And so I, I think that 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 has really been the dynamic that's often driven these outbursts. Yes, I mean, that makes a, yes, makes a lot of sense. But at the same time, and, um, you know, over the last couple of years, two or three years, you know, when this wolf warrior uh, diplomacy really, and particularly Zhao, uh, Zhao Lijian, um, but at the same time, you then, like, you could be like the next day, have, uh, uh, comments made by people in different parts of the government, um, the sounding a very different tone. So I guess the question I've always had is, you know, who does, um, you know, Wolf Warrior Diplomat speak for? And mm. I, 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 you know, on one hand, you're arguing that they really are speaking for she, but even sometimes she comes out, and as you said, you know, he comes out with something that suggest that well maybe it's you know not as bad as the 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 what came out of the foreign ministry so i i like some sort of insight into that yeah so so i think that that's why i i kind of think of there being these two tendencies and it's not like one one tendency switches off when the other comes into action um it, it, there are you know the vast majority of chinese diplomats um are professionals who have decided that they wanted to go into government service because they were attracted to the art of diplomacy. And just, just like diplomats in the US, they, they chose that vocation instead of joining the military or some, some, you know, some other way of serving their nation, which used a different set of uh, slightly harder tools to achieve, to achieve their objectives. And so, you know, I think by disposition, most Chinese diplomats, just like most diplomats in most countries, are attracted to this idea that they can serve their nation by persuading others and making their case to the world. And that, that is kind of the default setting for diplomats, minus these strange political incentives that, that China's political system introduces. And of course, Xi Jinping's objectives are also a little bit conflicted. There are kind of two Xi Jinping's as well. You know, there's the, the Xi Jinping that we sometimes see at, at, at forums like Davos or the Apex Summit, which where he's all about globalization and opening up to the world. And then there's the Xi Jinping, which is on display more frequently in um, 
in a kind of domestic context where he wears his mouse suit and he talks about, you know, any, anyone who, uh, you know, bullies or tries to oppress China will end up with their skulls crushed against the wall or some, some bizarre thing that he said in a recent speech. You know, and so, so there are those, those she sets differing objectives and Chinese diplomats just have to do their best to kind of walk the line between those two tendencies. We also have read, you know, um, articles and comments by uh, former diplomats, you know, more senior people who seem to be, at least to me, trying to do damage control, I guess, which also led me to ask the question, sort of how seriously does, should one take these outbursts? Yeah, I mean, I think, um... I think a lot of, of Chinese diplomats are pretty concerned by the tone and the, the direction that things have taken. Um, it, it, that's not to say that um, they're wholeheartedly opposed to it. You know, I, there is this, this sense, which it has, has its roots in reality, that, that the international system has changed. China is now, has taken a more central role on the world stage and, deserves to be treated differently. That's not, you know, that that's borne out by looking at China's GDP figures, not just by listening to, to speeches. And so th there's this phrase that they, they kind of use in Beijing where they say you can't hide an elephant. You know, the, the idea that China has become too big to take on that kind of low key role that defined its diplomacy in the 90s. But then, so I think most of the, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of consensus about that. And most of the debate is okay, well, if we're gonna take on a more prominent role, what should the tactics look like? Right. Should we try to persuade others and kind of meet the world um, on the world's terms? Or do we just say, here we stand, we can be no other, you take it or leave it. And if you leave it, there'll be consequences. Um, and and you know, in, in, in recent years, that kind of latter tendency has, has won out a little bit more. There are a lot of people who have, um, Misgivings. Both people like like China's former ambassador in Washington, Tui Ting Kai, who who never kind of publicly disavowed the wolf warrior approach, but clearly from his behavior, you can intuit that he he didn't like it that much, and he kind of mopped up after Zhao Li Jin and and other people. And and I know that there are figures in the foreign ministry who kind of are uncomfortable with that change. But the thing is about Chinese politics under Xi Jinping, there's this kind of ratchet effect where if, if she has turned up the tension to a seven or an eight when it comes to standing up to foreigners and being tough, you can't possibly be the person in a meeting who's, who puts their hand up and says, you know what, maybe we should go in with a four or a five this time and be a, be a little bit softer. You've got to be there at a seven or an eight or, or even harder because otherwise, it's risky for you. I actually, I talked to one Chinese trade negotiator who said that he thought the only people who were safe being more dovish in China's political system were those at the very top because they had a little bit of um, cushion for those to express those views. But anyone more junior has just got to be hawkish or be quiet. Um, so I think there's some of that going on as well. Yeah, we have some interesting questions from the audience. So let me um, turn to some of them. Um, and, and one person says that I've seen this new belligerent behavior also on the part of Chinese business people around the world, not just Chinese diplomats. They seem indifferent to alienating themselves from local populations, which only builds resentment. And um, I'm just, that's me comment on that. Yeah, you know, I, I don't, um... I haven't studied that in in very much detail, um, and so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to kind of pontificate too much on on the behavior of Chinese business people. I, I guess that um, a couple of things um, come to mind, and one is that that the new confidence I discussed on the part of Chinese diplomats about China's place in the world is also. Um, you know, applies to Chinese people more generally, right? The, the origin of this term wolf warrior diplomacy comes from this 
blockbuster movie released in 2017 called Wolf Warrior 2. And that, you know, it's not a very good movie. It's really like not my not my cup of tea, but it's a kind of Rambo style movie about Chinese action heroes battling it out with Western bad guys on the continent of Africa. And I, that it was a huge and unexpected commercial success because it captured something of this sense that China had arrived. And I think a lot of people, including Chinese business people, probably feel that. In addition that to this new confidence, there's this constant sense, which, which again, like, is not is not crazy. Like, there's this sense that the Chinese citizens have been looked down on for a long time by people around the world not taken as seriously as they should be subjected to prejudice and so, you know some of some of that is propaganda but some of that's real and that that i think oftentimes leads to people having a bit of a chip on their shoulder and so so those two things like the confidence and the chip on your shoulder leads to a pretty prickly display and I guess that that plays out with business people. Well, here's actually a question that came in as well about this movie. And the, 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 uh, the um, person says, I imagine that the CCP doesn't appreciate this connection to the Wolf Warrior movie. How much do factional politics play into this diplomatic approach? I mean, your answer suggests that they, that in fact, they like this connection or, or, or no? And so, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, kind of two separate things. So on the, on the factional politics, I haven't seen that there, there may well be connections to different factions in Chinese elite politics that play out. I have uh, pretty much no visibility into that. And, and what I observe from the outside is I think this like overwhelming dominance of Xi Jinping and then many actors across the bureaucracy trying to position themselves for, for maximum benefit around Xi and the power base that he has amassed. I haven't seen much evidence that that kind of um, dissent from Wolf Warrior diplomacy is linked to elite factional politics, but you know, maybe, maybe when um, when historians get access to if and when historians get access to the Xi Jinping archives, maybe we'll find out one day. Um, in terms of whether they like the um, the approach, I think on on the whole, Chinese diplomats don't like it very much, and I think that the reason for that is kind of kind of goes back to you know we were talking about this this chip on the shoulder, right? What from their perspective, countries around the world, led by the United States, are criticizing China for its economic policies, its foreign policies, its political system, its ideological system, its education system. You know, they, they, they feel that there's this kind of global pylon effect led by the US and that nothing they do or say is right. Um, and so all they're doing from their perspective is trying to stand up for China's interests and make China's case and not be bullied. And suddenly they find themselves being called names, you know, for, for just doing their job. And I think you can take issue with that interpretation of events, right? And say that now, now that China has reached um, the, the size that it has economically and militarily, it can't expect to be treated. It's going to be subjected to a, a new level of scrutiny that's just going to come mm -hmm. along with that as part and parcel. But they, they don't see things like that. So they, they kind of feel like, well, why are we being called names just for just for being good diplomats? Right. Because there's another question that's sort of uh, sort of uh, trying to find out, um, you know, if there is a, a reaction against this, because the question is, you know, how is China dealing with the action of a wolf warrior? Um, and and the, the question about this uncontrolled aggressive actions um, that may undermine their reputations and confuse um, you know, diplomatic action strategies and goals and whether China is trying to balance this. But so your, your answer seems to be that overall that it actually it's been quite welcomed. Um, I'm, I mean that but at the same time, you also do mention there are others, there are people, including a number that um, are 
in their own quiet way expressing dissent. So I guess, what do you see as, as the efforts you might say of damage control? Yeah, um, so I, I think um, you have to kind of split, split the wolf warrior phenomenon apart um, when it comes to this. I think that Xi Jinping likes the assertive brash tone and um, there's very little evidence, I think, that he wants that to be changed. He encouraged the start of it, after all, um, and um, it's reflected in the way that he communicates publicly as well. Um, so I, I don't really expect that to, to change in the short term. Um, but what has kind of long confused me about the wolf warrior phenomenon is, is this freelancing that's taking place on Twitter. You know, mm. if you think about Zhao Lijian's tweets on the origins of COVID-19, US-China relations it, are the most sensitive part of Chinese foreign policy and is it's traditionally the purview of the top leader, whether that's Mao or Deng or Xi or whoever. So the idea that this lowly foreign ministry official, this mid-level foreign ministry official could, could freelance Chinese US policy is, is just, it's unthinkable in China's political system, but it's especially unthinkable in Xi Jinping's China because his whole political project is about asserting the control of the party over every aspect of the Chinese state and many aspects of Chinese business and society. Um, and then ensuring that his own personal writ runs strong throughout the Communist Party. So, so, so that that kind of freelancing seems to me completely incompatible with. So how do, how do you explain that? I mean, the fact that they have taken the Twitter. <laughs> I I think I think what happened was that the 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 individual Chinese officials were trying to match a tone that she had set and they moved faster than their own bureaucracies were able to. So, you know, they, they kind of saw an opportunity to get promoted or to, to get attention from the top leadership, especially from Xi and those around him. And they took it even before the, 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 the ministers and the vice ministers in the foreign ministry had kind of um, had got on board with that approach. So I, I think that's kind of what was happening. And so what, what I expect is that we'll see um, a continuation of the assertiveness, but we'll see more consistency uh, in the way that it's executed and a little bit less freelancing. Um, but, you know, uh, predictions in, in Xi Jinping's China are not a good game to get into, so mm. I'm not sure. Okay. There's an interesting question um, from the audience that says, you've mentioned the discrepancy between personal and official personalities of Chinese diplomats. I've always thought and taught that spokesmen and diplomats should loyally reflect the stance of their governments. This is actually the number one rule of their profession. According to you, what should be the most important characteristic of diplomats? Well, I, I guess there are, there are different answers depending on which, which group of diplomats you're talking to. So when it comes to US diplomats, um, the, the, the best answer I got when I asked that question was from um, a man called, uh, called Chaz Freeman, who was um, a trans, uh, yeah, I'm sure you know him well, it, it was a translator during the Nixon visits to Beijing to meet Chairman Mao, and he, he went on to serve as uh, a, a US ambassador, I think, to Indonesia, and, you know, a very, very storied US diplomat. And he, um, he, he said that he thinks of diplomacy as a, as a performance art, where you um, use, you, you take your official government talking points, and you use your knowledge of the history and the culture of the place where you are working and you you kind of get that intangible sense of the mood in the room and, and what's going to be acceptable and you you massage those talking points in a way that makes your point of view seem like the um the self-interest of the person across the table from you so i think that is like the definition of, of what good diplomacy looks like in the US context. I think it looks a little bit different in the Chinese context. 
Um, for Chinese diplomats, typically success has been uh, clearly relaying the intentions of the party center and not deviating at all in tone or message. And um, so, you know, sometimes that that leads to them coming across as very stilted, but it can actually also lead to these in extremely impressive and, and dexterous performances from Chinese diplomats when it comes to, you know, I think think of someone like Yang Jiechi, who's now a, a Politburo member and is China's most senior diplomat. Mm -hmm. He is capable at times of, you know, making jokes based on stuff that he's read in the New York Times cultural section. He's he's um, he established in the late 70s a, a connection to the Bush family, which he has kept ever since um, through you know multiple presidents. And he clearly is capable of great charm when he needs to be. But he also is capable of these kind of withering dress downs that he delivers. He goes red in the face. He gets extremely angry. And two seconds after he's done, he's back to the charming mode. You know, this guy has extraordinary self-control. And so I, and, and what, what he has become a master at is relaying exactly the message that Beijing wants to relay in exactly the tone with exactly the right timing. And I think that that's kind of what success looks like for a Chinese diplomat a little bit more. Well, here I've got a question from a, a, a former diplomat. This is uh, Ira Kassoff. It says, Peter, thanks for an excellent presentation. Tactics you describe are quite familiar to me as a retired diplomat. Have you detected differences in approach in different countries? A more lovable in smaller countries that, that China is trying to win. And, and on a related question is um, about, um, um, go ahead, answer, oh yes. Um, is the wolf warrior diplomacy received in the global South um, as negatively as in the West? Or does this, uh, or do these uh, anti-Western streak appeal to anti-colonialist, post-colonial mindset? Uh, they're both great questions. And I wanna say hi to Ira, because we used to work together. But um, I, I, I think I can actually take the two questions um, together. Um, and when it when it comes to to wolf warrior diplomacy, I I kind of think about um, the tactics as uh, you can split them up in a number of different ways. And the, the two most important ways I think are, are power, the power of the people that Chinese diplomats are addressing, and then um, you know whether the country is a developing nation or not. So in terms of power, I think that Chinese diplomats these these are big generalizations, right? But on the, on the whole. Chinese diplomats tend to um, demonstrate a little bit more restraint in their tactics when they're talking to um, the United States in particular, which is funny because if you go and talk to people in Washington, you would think that like America had been the primary target of Wolf Warrior diplomacy, but it's, it's not true. Uh, Chinese diplomats have been far more aggressive in countries like Canada, France, Britain, Australia, than they have been toward their US counterparts. And I think the, the reason for that is that um, the, the consequences of angering the world's most uh, powerful military state with the world's largest economy are still pretty substantial and Beijing respects that and its diplomats respond appropriately. The consequences of angering political elites in Australia or Britain are much lower. And so I do think you can see some difference in tactics based on how Beijing evaluates the strength of its interlocutors. Um, the developing world point I think is, is important. And, um, and I, I do think that there are differences in, in both Beijing's approach and the reception of the tactics. Um, I, but, but, it, but again, it's not, it's not uniform, right? Like we've seen lots of displays of wolf warrior diplomacy toward India and the Indian public seems to have been thoroughly um, alienated by it. We've also seen wolf warrior tactics in, in places like Venezuela, Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Brazil, you know, so, so it, it's, not, it's not like China takes this, necessarily takes a softer approach with, um, the developing world. But I do think, you know, if you think about Africa, we've seen very few, if any, examples of wolf warrior diplomacy. And there is definitely more of a 
a kind of charm game that's going on. Um, when it comes to how those tactics are received, I think actually they're also pretty unpopular in developing countries. It's just that the governments of those countries probably, I think, put more stock in the ability to, to attract Chinese investment than they do in how polite Chinese envoys are being. And so there's a bit of a difference in, um, in, 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 in the ranking of priorities there that probably makes a difference in, in how those tactics play out. I think the group that seems to have, have liked Wolf Warrior diplomacy the most isn't necessarily confined to the global south. It's actually this kind of group of, of populist leaders um, who, who bulk at the, the, the leadership of the United States in the world. So you think of Viktor Orban in Hungary, Vladimir Putin in Russia, um, leaders like that, I think, whether or not they're part of the, the global north, the global south, they, they tend to like that language and it resonates with them. So that was a little convoluted, but I hope, I hope that helps kind of break it down a bit. Right, thank you. Um, and there's also a, a question that sort of gets at some of the themes you touched on, but um, let me just read it. It says, do you think there's a cause and effect relationship between wolf warrior diplomacy situation versus the nationalist education, um, on history at least, that has been enhanced since the Tiananmen massacre in China? Um, so. Yes, um, I do. Um, I think that um, the, the nationalist education campaign from the, the 90s onwards um, changed yeah, change the expectations of the, the Chinese public in terms of how its, its um, envoys should be behaving um, and, and created, a, I guess, like a demand for a more assertive style from, especially from young Chinese people who are, you know, now many, many of them are middle-aged and and, and also from you know people on the internet who, who kind of saw, uh, heard all of these things about China's need to, to recapture its past greatness and um, then saw the, the relatively low key way that, that Chinese diplomats were behaving and, and, and wanted a more assertive approach. So definitely from the grassroots level, um, I think it made a difference. And also, you know, there's, there's Chinese officials who who went through that education system are now joining the foreign ministry and um, in, in some cases have reached kind of mid level roles and and they too have a set of expectations which were framed by that kind of nationalist education and you know it's uh, my my friend. Um, fellow journalist Keith Jai when he was at Reuters wrote this great piece where he described the return of Zhao Lijian to Beijing after his posting in Islamabad and his his spat with um with Susan Rice online and he was met by a group of young Chinese diplomats outside his office who applauded literally applauded him and, and kind of praised the way that he had behaved. And so I think inside and outside of the foreign ministry, the, the education cap, the patriotic education campaign had had an impact. Well, and let me just um, insert something here. And that is that, you know, as you yourself said, these people are, you know, very sophisticated. They, a lot of them have received, you know, international educations and such. Um, and, and, and I don't know, do you get a sense of, any kind of um, divider between those who have the many um, that have have increasing numbers that have studied abroad and those that haven't, you know, do, does this wolf warriors go down better with some than others, depending on how much exposure they've had to um, being abroad in foreign so, media? Uh, uh, among Chinese diplomats. No, no, among the, uh, uh, well, them, but also just the, the reception that they have, that they get from the more general Chinese public, including those, the, the increasing numbers that have traveled abroad, that have been educated abroad. Um, yeah, I'm just before I answer your question, I'm going to close the blinds because at yes. the moment I've got a kind of a two faced thing going right. on that's distracting me. <laughs> Give me one second. All right, thank you. That's much more comfortable. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, 
the truth is I don't I don't really know um my my instinct and it's sort of intuition is that there you can you could make a case that um those who have studied abroad or are as likely if not more likely to to like the tactics in, in my experience people people with that background frequently come back with with a sense that um you know china needs to stand up for itself and that the the country they've studied in is not all that impressive and in fact china has a has a great deal going for it uh but it's it's so hard to to mm. detect um to, to, to kind of fill out those differences any kind of rigorous way with the chinese public but the, the honest answer is I don't, I don't really know okay this is another question it sort of gets a bit to some of the earlier ones and that is um, one hears that the foreign ministry is relatively low in the pecking order in China's governance structure. How would you reconcile that interpretation with the outside impact the wolf warriors are having on perceptions of China in, uh, abroad and indeed in perhaps compromising other PRC foreign policy objectives? Yeah, it's um it's a great question, and um it's certainly true um that the foreign ministry is not a uh, a super powerful bureaucratic actor. Um, but I do think that it for a number of reasons it has a kind of outsized role representing China to the world. So if you if you think about the U.S. Um, and the way that the U.S. communicates with the world, first and foremost you have the, the president and the White House, and you have all of the executive agencies, but then you also have Hollywood, businesses, civil society, um, you know, the, the fashion industry, like all, all of these things are ways that America communicates with the world. And um, ch in, in China, those, those kind of outlets are far, far more circumscribed. So Chinese top leaders, including President Xi, communicate uh, with the outside, communicate publicly, relatively infrequently. And when they do so, they kind of speak in these uh, Communist Party slogans, which are not very relatable even to Chinese audiences, but they're certainly not very relatable to people outside China. Um, Chinese business people, as the case of Jack Ma helped to illustrate quite recently, are strongly discouraged from ever speaking out on kind of political or foreign policy topics. Chinese civil society, exactly the same thing. It's media and cultural industries, the same thing. And so on, on a lot of days, on a lot of issues, the most prominent Chinese voice um, on, on uh, you know, China's view on the Middle East or whatever else is going on in the world is gonna come from the foreign ministry spokesperson. And so not, not only, you know, that's, that's like an outsized role for the foreign ministry, but it's also an outsized role for this small office inside the foreign ministry, the information office, which kind of deals with those, those press conferences. But in this strange way, these kind of, um, uh, relatively unempowered bureaucratic actors have this, this global clout, which um, just comes almost as a, it's a sort of idiosyncratic feature of the Chinese system. Mm. And this is an interesting um, question here as well as about the digital media and general population's involvement. In China, many policy issues and practices, including international issues, are hotly commented and debated in public medias and WeChat. In a way, China's diplomacy is no longer wholly decided by the political elites. Rather, um, uh, it's influenced by popular media, general population uh, to a certain extent. I guess the question the, the, the question I want to know is sort of, to what degree do you think it is? And Yeah, so um, I think there's been a really interesting um, shift in the way that this has worked 10 years ago 12 years ago the like online nationalists who who commented on what the foreign ministry was saying and what china was doing in the world seemed 
far more out there and radical in their views and hardline in their views than the Chinese government did. And, you know, there are these famous stories of, of, of nationalist members of the Chinese public sending calcium tablets to the foreign ministry <laughs> with the implication that their backbones were too weak and they needed to, to kind of strengthen up. Um, and, you know, of, of Chinese diplomats, and, and this, this still happens, by the way, trawling through websites, looking at these pay, you know, page after page of these just vitriolic comments saying, why are you so weak? Why are you acting like traitors? And so that kind of thing went on for a long, long time. Um, and the, the foreign ministry kind of felt a little bit out on its own, but it was, it had cover from the fact that that was the tone that Chinese leaders seemed to want to set in the world under both Jiang Zemin and then under Hu Jintao. Um, what's happened under Xi Jinping is that those popular nationalist voices have, have become, to some extent, almost indistinguishable from the voice of the Chinese government. You know, if you think about the, the Global Times, this nationalist um, sort of party tabloid, uh, its views and the way it expressed itself was extremely different to the foreign ministry 10 years ago. Now, on a good day, I can't tell very much difference between a Global Times editorial and the way that the foreign ministry spokespeople communicate. So, so what, what I mean to say is that, um, yes, those online opinions are, are, are very important and they, they were 10 years ago and they are now, but they're so much more mainstream now than they used to be. And there has, there's kind of been this um, meeting of minds between that like online nationalism and the voice of the Chinese party state. Hmm, interesting. Um, there's a question um, about the political figures. So the frequency that we mentioned particular political figures such as Xi Jinping, Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump has greatly increased in recent years. Do you think there's a general decline of institutional regulations? Why do personalities of political leaders play a bigger role both in domestic and international relations? Hmm. That's, a, that's a really good question. I, I honestly, I don't know if it's empirically true or not. I just, I don't, I'm not disagreeing with it. I just don't, I don't know. I, I would have imagined that um, there was a point at which people spoke a great deal about Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin, and maybe things weren't so different. But um, but I I I'm, I I don't feel qualified to kind of offer um, a definitive judgment on that. What where where I do have some thoughts is is the way that it kind of relates to China, um, and and I do think that the the, the question's on to something there. Xi Jinping has a, a very um, amb ambivalent relationship with political institutions, I think. On, on the one hand, he is the, you know, archetypal institution builder. His project is all about strengthening the kind of Leninist inspired party state and, and making sure that, it, that information and commands flow smoothly from top to bottom, that information um, flows in the way that it's supposed to um, and building out bureaucracies that are capable of realizing um, Beijing's ambitions. So, so on that, in that sense, he's an institution builder, but in the sense that he uh, abolished presidential term limits and has um, completely disregarded many of the norms that were built up around Chinese elite politics in the 1990s, Xi Jinping has a very adversarial relationship with institutions. And that part, I think, has led to a focus um, much more on Xi than on this kind of collective leadership that, that China used to have. And in, in many ways, and you probably could, could pick up in it in my talk, you, you, can, you can use the will of Xi Jinping and the will of the Chinese government interchangeably in a way that a decade ago or 20 years ago, we were talking about a, a group of collective leaders that made decisions and there was one person who was first among equals but we, we thought of the leadership as a, as a much more of a group affair and you know in, in, I, and in, from that respect I guess it does make sense to talk more about Xi than, um, than it would have done his predecessors just simply because he's more powerful. Okay um, we're also out of time so I, um, I'll 
poses uh, this is sort of last question. And that is sort of what do you see um, as the future? So what is, in your opinion, the future of wolf warrior diplomacy and its effects on China's foreign policy? Yeah, um, so I, I kind of think um, wolf warrior diplomacy is, is here to stay for quite a long time. Um, the, in the past, when there, when there have been these periods of kind of overreach in Chinese foreign policy, it's usually been fo followed by a period of rethinking and recalibration where China has um, worked to mend its reputation. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier the, the period after the, the Cultural Revolution or, um, you know, the period after the Tiananmen Massacre. Um, and, and what's been striking for a long time to, to sort of long-term observers of China is that the, the backlash has been there for quite some time and yet the behavior has persisted and there has been no recalibration. And the reason I think, or the, the, the primary reason for that is that Chinese elites, first among them Xi Jinping, have changed their perception of China's position relative to the world. Um, they, there is this, this widespread belief that Western political institutions are weak, that democracies are gridlocked and incapable of reforming themselves, that China's system is on the ascendant, and that China doesn't need to approach the world in a deferential way where it asks for permission for its actions because its economic and its military might will demand respect. Um, and, you know, therefore, wolf warrior diplomacy can continue as a, as, a, as a mouthpiece for that newfound power, and there's no need to recalibrate. And, you know, it's, it's important to caveat that with the fact that sometimes these, these recalibrations have happened very suddenly and have taken the whole world by surprise. After all, Chairman Mao, who had just torched his relationship with the Soviets and alienated pretty much every country in the world, then opened up to Nixon's America. And so, I, I wouldn't want to underestimate the ability of the Chinese political system to, to do um, quite deep-seated rethinking while the rest of us are looking in a different direction. But based on the kind of tea leaves that I see in front of me, I don't I don't see very much prospect for that right now. And so I'm a little bit a little bit pessimistic. Yeah. Well, let me just ask one uh, related question, a follow-on to that, and that is. Um, the, the, the question is saying, you know, you talked about this, uh, the, the spat with Susan Rice um, and, and that, that they see a modest uptick of U.S. officials engaging social media posts from PRC channels. Uh, why do you think this is and do you think it's counterproductive? And so in other words, I guess the question is, should there, should U.S., I mean, the, your, in relation to your broader comments a moment ago, so do mm. you think that the um, U.S., but others, should start rethinking how to uh, respond and, and whether they should take on these wolf warriors? My instinct is that um, the, the wolf warriors will kind of... Um, do, do damage to themselves without the US having to do very much. Um, and, you know, we, we talked earlier about how many veteran Chinese diplomats understand that these tactics are, are hurting China and are creating a, a backlash. And so, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see really how engaging helps too much when the PRC is damaging its own interests by pursuing these tactics. And so I think my instinct would be in most cases to just let those comments sit and do their work. But, um, you know, I, uh, uh, no, no, no one's given me the job of policymaker. So I'm not sure that those remarks count for very much. Okay, well, wonderful. This has been a very enlightening, fascinating um, uh, webinar. So thank you very much, Peter. And thank you. Um, Good luck, and we'll see. Hopefully, see you back in in China. So, thank you. All right, thank you very much, and Perfect. thank the audience thank you. for the uh, great questions.